We are going to start off right away with a little icebreaker chat. Uh, so I would encourage everyone, we really, as Christine said, we want to uh, build on the knowledge that's here um, in the group who's attending today. So we're going to start right off with asking everyone to please share one reader's advisory tip uh, that you use when serving kids from kindergarten through third grade and their families. And you can go ahead and do that in the chat session. We'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and get that conversation started. And it looks like many of you are typing, so hopefully we'll be seeing some things here soon. Great, Diana, yes, asking them what they've read recently and really loved. That motivation is a key. Yes, thanks, Joyce. Oftentimes with kids, giving them a little more time to express themselves. Using your resources, bookmarks, and novelists, Will, yeah. Talking directly to the child, absolutely. <laughs> Always a great one. Choice, Karen, yes. Favorites. Kate and Jennifer, right, centering the child there. Music, too, definitely, definitely. Mary, not just what the adults want them to read. Yes. Yes, Alex, we are going to be talking about levels too, but important point. Finding a subject that interests Francis and Melissa. Great. Great. So I can tell right off from, from the chat, we've got a, a lot of great uh, knowledge in in the session already, and this is just fabulous. Uh, we're going to go ahead and build on that um, as we move through today's session. So please feel free to continue to use that chat option um, as things come up, and we'll do our best to manage with Christine's help, checking that and uh, continuing to go along with the rest of the session. So I'm going to go ahead and move ahead. Thank you very much for contributing, everyone. Uh, quickly go over our learning objectives for today. Uh, by the end of today's session, uh, hopefully you will be able to identify what we are calling five grade level reading skills, identify supportive elements in texts for developing readers, and be able to navigate reading levels, and apply the five skills to your reader's advisory. So let's talk a little bit about why focus on grade level reading. So uh, here in Denver, this is uh, a very important topic to us, uh, not only at the library, but also in a bigger perspective with the city. Um, our mayor has five goals for Denver's children, and one of those goals is to increase the number of students who can read at grade level at the end of their third grade year. So we're dovetailing nicely into that priority that our mayor has set. What you're seeing on your screen is a map uh, from our Mayor's Office of Children's Affairs. The data comes from Denver Public Schools. And as you can see, uh, in the city of Denver, 38% of third graders read at grade level. Um, and I should also note that in the state of Colorado overall, it's a little bit better. It's 40% of children in third grade read at grade level. Uh, but this is definitely a problem. Uh, and so we are trying to figure out what we can do to increase the number of children uh, who are reading at grade level. Um, the Office of Children's Affairs finds it's very important because 
Uh, the ability to read at grade level by the end of third grade really is an important marker for future academic success. And we also see this at the Denver Public Library as really an extension of our early literacy and every child ready to read work that we've been doing with children from birth through preschool. We see this as the next step. We have been helping uh, kids and families get ready to read and now we want to be able to support them intentionally on that reading journey as they actually start to learn to read um, and we want to ensure that our staff is confident serving those kindergarten through third graders just as much as they've become confident in serving the younger kids so what we've been doing here at the Denver Public Library, some first steps. We were very fortunate at the beginning of 2018 to be able to hire a limited term librarian. Uh, in our world, that means um, it is not a permanent position. We had them for two years. Uh, that will run out at the end of 2019, but fingers crossed that will become a permanent position. And the ability to hire that additional person has helped us really be able to dig in um, and devote time and energy to this work. So with that additional staff member uh, here at the Children's Library, which is the area I supervise, um, we created an internal work team of four librarians to get started on this project. We did a whole bunch of research and we really made an intentional effort to reconnect with the Denver Public Schools as part of this process as well. So we had a very uh, large and ambiguous charge at first in our work plan, strategic plan that the library set forward, we were charged to determine ways to support grade level reading. Uh, this is a huge idea. <laughs> it was a little daunting. It was kind of difficult to wrap our heads around the task. Uh, what would the role of the library be? What would the role of the children's library in particular be? Um, how would we communicate with all of our branches? How could we make a really big impact? Um, we got going on that research and we came up with our mission statement that you can see here and a work plan. Uh, the work plan is a lot more detail, but it really gets distilled down into this mission statement, which is to support and empower library staff, families and educators to connect children in kindergarten through third grade with diverse books they enjoy and that inspire curiosity to foster lifelong readers. Um, so we are going to also be talking here um, about our five grade level reading skills. And I, if you've never heard of these, please don't panic. <laughs> um, it's just a title that we gave to a set of skills that all developing readers need. Um, and it was just our way to really kind of wrap our heads around. We were learning a lot and we've doing a lot of that research and then trying to figure out how to distill that and make it something that could be taken by anybody at the library to help them serve this customer base. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague Liesl, who is going to fill you in. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Anne. That was a great introduction. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about those five grade level reading skills that Anne introduced. Um, as Anne said, these are skills that, uh, that are part of the process of learning to read. There are other skills that are needed. There's lots of other stuff going on. Um, but these are some skills that you can kind of hone in on when you're doing your work um, to, help you, to help you know uh, what that process is. Um, we, uh, we know that the learning at school is only a small part of the learning environment that kids are exposed to. So we were looking at how library could staff can support caregivers who want to help their children build these grade level reading skills, who build their reading skills. Um, how can we support students who are struggling? And also important, how can we better support educators when they are looking for resources to better help their students? So these skills are similar to the Every Child Ready to Read practices, which you might be familiar with uh, in your work with, with younger kids, in your work with preschoolers and younger. Um, these skills provide a foundation for our reader's advisory, for our programming, for our outreach, and they focus on five specific aspects of learning to read. These are background knowledge, decoding, reading motivation, fluency, 
and comprehension. Each of these elements is part of the process of, of, that contributes to skilled reading. Um, these are ways that we can contribute or can collaborate with students as they build their strength. And so I'll go through and I'll talk about each of these skills, and then we'll talk about how you can incorporate these skills into your reader's advisory. All right, so this first one is background knowledge. Background knowledge refers to what kids already know before they begin reading a text. From birth, children are building their background knowledge. They're learning vocabulary, they're gaining an understanding of new concepts and experiences, and that background knowledge will play a huge role in learning to read. And even after you learn to read, background knowledge continues to play a role in skilled reading all throughout our lives. Even skilled readers benefit from the background knowledge they have. A 1988 experiment, which has been widely repeated, asked readers to read a text about baseball. Poor readers who were familiar with the sport understood more from the text even than skilled readers if the skilled readers weren't familiar with the rules of, of baseball. Understanding the con context for what we're reading, knowing the vocabulary, feeling comfortable with the concepts discussed, all of that goes into helping skilled readers and developing readers alike. And especially when kids are just starting out as readers, it's important that they have some understanding of the words and concepts that they are reading. There's an old saying that you might have heard that kids up through third grade are learning to read and kids it, older than third grade are reading to learn. But that's not exactly true. Kids are always reading to learn. Skilled readers are better able to get more complex information out of the books they read, but even developing readers are learning from their reading. Think about the ways that we introduce new subjects and vocabulary words and story time. Even at a very young age, we're using those books to introduce background knowledge. And think about how a six-year-old might ask you where the dinosaur books are and want to learn everything they can about dinosaurs. Or have you ever met a kid who can name every type of construction vehicle because they read about it? The fact that we're, we're building background knowledge and learning from books early on is important because it means that we can promote background knowledge by exposing kids to books about all types of topics. Uh, so even, even at a very young age, we're building that background knowledge when we give kids books about different subjects and different ideas. The vocabulary that kids develop when they listen to us read out loud, and the, fact, the facts that they learn when they delve into the nonfiction section, all of that will help developing readers find their footing. There are lots of ways to develop background knowledge through books in, in kindergarten through third grade, and we'll go through some of that, and we'll go through some ways you can find those books as we go through this presentation. All right, skill number one, background knowledge. Skill number two, decoding. When we learn to read, we are looking, we're learning to connect the way a word looks on the page with, what, with how it sounds and with what it means. Decoding is what happens when we use our knowledge of letter-sound relationships to pronounce words that are written down. The relationship between the way letters look and the way they sound is called phonics. So understanding phonics helps us decode words. When learners sound out words, when they go b, a, to sound out bat, they're decoding words. That's what they're doing. Uh, the English language has 26 letters that make 42 to 46 sounds when they're pronounced. And in order to read an unknown word, a child needs to be able to look at the letter and know what sound it's supposed to make, be able to connect it with that sound. Most kids need systematic, explicit phonics instruction to learn to read. And that's the kind of learning that usually happens in schools. In libraries, what we're doing is providing a support role. I often find myself directing parents and caregivers to our beginning or easy reader section to find books that their child can use to help practice decoding, to help support what they're learning in school. Kids who are learning to connect the way a letter looks with the way a letter sounds benefit from books with like the very simplest words. Think of words that are made up of a consonant and then a vowel and then a consonant, like bat or cat or mat. It's got a consonant, k, it's got a vowel, a, and it's got a, another consonant, t. Those are the easiest words to start that sounding out process. And they're a lot easier to sound out than, than longer words, which we'll get to later. They'll get, they'll get there. All right, so we've got our first two skills. Our third skill, the next skill, is reading motivation. And this is kind of our specialty in libraries. Learning to read takes a ton of practice. We're basically big data machines synthesizing all kinds of knowledge about sounds and letters and reading rules as we read more and more and more. And explicit systematic instruction is crucial, but on top of that, it takes just a ton of practice. Kids who are excited to read will be much more likely to get the practice they need. Plus, kids who are engaged in what they're reading are more likely to develop the focus that they need, the kind of sustained attention that they need to become skilled, lifelong readers. And a huge factor in developing reading motivation is choice. 
kids who are allowed and who are encouraged to exert some type of choice over what they read are much more motivated. Another important factor in this is self-concept, the way that we think about ourselves. If you think about yourself as a reader, you're much more likely to find success when you're, when you're developing your reading skills. And so that reading motivation builds into that too, builds into that, do you think of yourself as a reader? All right, skill number four, fluency. This is the ability to read a text quickly, accurately, and with expression. This is the step that helps readers connect word recognition with word meaning. Fluent readers recognize words and comprehend them at the same time. You can hear it when they read out loud because they're reading a word and understanding what it means at the same time. They very, very beginning readers are just sounding the word out and then it takes them a minute to figure out what that word means. But when you hear a fluent reader, you can hear that in, their, in the way that they're reading. You can hear the change and you can tell that they're understanding what they read as they read it. Fluency practice happens when kids find books at the right level and then practice reading those books. So our library here in Denver, we don't provide reading instruction, but we do help connect kids and educators with books at the right level so that they can practice their fluency, so that they can develop this fluency skill. Word recognition is an important part of fluency, but fluency really develops when you read the whole text together. It's that understanding the meaning as you go along. And fluency also depends on background knowledge and it depends on vocabulary. And then fluency also is, is, is helped along by executive function, that ability to filter out information and to develop your focus. Because we have to be able to infer, organize, and pay attention all at the same time, all at, while you're decoding and while you're trying to figure out um, what is next and what sound the letters make and all of that stuff is going on at the same time. So fluency is a pretty good thing and it, it takes practice. You'll see readers develop fluency as they go along, but it takes a while for that, for that last one to develop. All right, our next skill, skill number five, this is comprehension. And comprehension is this beautiful thing. It's the reason for reading. All of the skills we just talked about, background knowledge, decoding, reading motivation and fluency all add up to comprehension. Kids who are learning to read are using a variety of comprehension techniques as they go along that will help them figure out the meaning of, of a text. This can also be helped out by considerate texts, by, by books that kind of have features that, that will help a reader figure out what they're doing. Um, you might look for a clear sequence of topics. You might look for the use of cohesive words that tie the text together, like first, second, However, although, those things, those text markers that help you figure out what's going on and what you're reading. And then another thing that helps is uh, introducing new vocabulary carefully re and repeating words so that kids can become familiar with them. Uh, that's also a way to help support those developing readers. So when you introduce a new word in the text, explain what it means and then repeat it a few times so that a kid can really get to know what that word is. Often you'll see early and developing readers gravitate towards book series that have consistent characters and setting from book to book. Those kids are beginning to read for meaning. They're beginning to become absorbed by what they meet, by, by what they read. So think about the kids who read all of the Magic Treehouse books in a row or the kids who love Elephant and Piggy. Those kids get to know those characters and they're starting to read for meaning. All right, so those are the five skills that we came up with. As I said before, there are lots of other factors that go into learning to read, but these five skills are the ones that we've picked out that we think are particularly relevant to libraries. These are things that we think we can contribute to here from our, from our vantage point. Um, and we're learning as we go. It's all, it's all, it's all stuff that we're, we're figuring out as we go along. Um, okay, text can help support these five skills and Anne will talk more about that. But first, let's pause and reflect a little bit on these five grade level reading skills. And we so let's, let's this is Christine. in the chat. Sorry, we just had a quick question from Deborah um, about fluency. Um, and she's asking if it's true that reading books a little bit below current reading level helps improve fluency. Absolutely, yes. You'll, you'll see that kids who are reading books that they're really comfortable at with, the ones that, that, like you said, are a little bit below their, maybe their assigned reading level, they're reading those books with much more expression. They're really understanding as they go. Uh, in school, you might be always reaching for the next level. We've, we've found out that DPS goals, Denver Public Schools goals, are to really be moving kids quickly from level to level to level. But, uh, but when you give a kid a chance to read a book that they're really comfortable with, you're absolutely right. That's exactly where fluency develops. 
All right, so let's let's keep keep chatting a little bit. Um, we've got a couple of couple of chat questions for you. Uh, my first question is, and you can just meet me in the in the chat pod for this. Um, do these five? Oh, actually, one of one of these we're going to do as a hand raise. This first one let's do as a hand raise. Um, so in the chat pod, let me know. Do the five grade level reading skills connect with the practices you use for children from birth through preschool? Do these connect with maybe the um, the read, talk, play, sing practices that you've been you've been using? Um, meet me in the chat and maybe let's discuss how these how you're initially responding to these these five grade level reading skills. All right, looks like we've got some uh, some folks typing down there. That looks like as we said, resonating with some kind of, of the other people, um, kind of raising their hands, saying that it looks like it's resonating. So. Oh yeah, see, I'm not. I'm learning. I'm learning as I go about the uh, the hand raising. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> Yeah, Kate, that's 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 exactly right. We talk about that a lot when we're developing programming too. That's something we do, I think, really well is work on background knowledge. When we introduce kids, maybe you bring animals to the library, or maybe you introduce a new craft or or a new art project. I think that helps with background knowledge a lot. Um, maybe you have like a firefighter story time. Kids get to know about firefighters. Yeah, reading motivation, I think, is my favorite thing because it's something I don't think people get in schools as much. Yes, and, and a lot of you talked when, when Ann first asked about reader's advisory questions and reader's advisory tips, asking kids what they're interested in. So that a lot of times means going to the nonfiction section. And so um, just like you said, Will, that, uh, that idea of, of background knowledge connecting with interest, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, y'all are really gravitating to the skills that I think are the, the ones that we do really well in the library, the, uh, the background knowledge and the reading motivation. Um, knowing about decoding and knowing about fluency and kind of working on those I think really helps. But yeah, I see a lot of people talking about background knowledge and about, about uh, reading motivation because it's, it's, it's our bread and butter. It's what we do every day. Yeah, Kate talks about how we talk with caregivers and, and parents. Uh huh. Letting letting parents know and, and caregivers know that it's important that these are these are skills that are developed by reading things maybe at above and below your reading level, so that kids have a lot of lot of options. I think that's right, Kate. I think that's a that's a, a really difficult conversation, and we'll get into that a little bit. How to kind of handle those conversations. And Lisa, I'm going to just jump in here and, and mention that these uh, five skills are also, um, this web webinar on Reader's Advisory is part of a series we're doing. So these five skills are also informing a, a lot of the work we're doing. Some of you have mentioned programming. Um, so this is just one way we're trying to uh, put everything together and all the different aspects that we do at the library. Yeah, exactly. I, it's. Uh... These are these are part of everything we're we're looking at and everything we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carrie, fluency. I know it's a and it's a tricky one that reading out loud um, is isn't something we always have options for at the library. Um, although I'm curious if folks have like any any reading out loud programs. I know some some libraries have a chance to read out loud to dogs and that kind of thing. All of that stuff might help with developing fluency. All right, Chell, we've got some we've got some good stuff. Thank you for for these responses to uh, to these five grade level reading skills. And and like Ann said, uh, if you come back for the other other uh, webinars in this series on supporting grade level reading, you'll see more mention of these. You'll see us talk about these in in different ways. 
Yeah, Alex, so you do have, you, you are looking at fluency when you do those reading out loud with teen buddies and reading out loud with dogs. All right, y'all, we're going to move on. Um, we're going to let Anne take over and, and talk about uh, ways that supportive elements in books might help developing readers. Um, thank you. Keep chatting if, if, if things come up, and we'll keep chatting throughout this presentation. And Anne, I'll pass it over to you. Great. All right. Thanks, Liesl. Uh, okay. So when we are trying to connect um, our customers uh, with the right books, um, it's helpful to know exactly what those books look like and what we're looking for in the titles we're choosing. So books can definitely help readers move through these various stages of reading development. Um, so the combination between the targeted direct instruction that kids are getting in school, um, supported by choice and a great selection of diverse books, uh, truly can help kids along this reading journey. Um, so the way a book is designed um, can really support uh, the child as they're moving through. Um, so we've got those earliest readers, the emergent readers who are really developing their pre-reading skills. Um, this is a lot of what we might be more focusing on with Every Child Ready to Read and in story time for younger kids, getting comfortable with the book as an object, turning pages, starting to recognize letters, words, even some language patterns. Um, this is when children are also learning the alphabetic principle that the letters printed on the page connect with sounds that that you hear. Uh, kids are then going to move through to being an early reader. They're going to start to use some strategies to predict words. Uh, this is when readers develop a habit of risk taking, which is actually really important in this process as they predict words and are also at the same time trying to keep that meaning of the word in their mind. Um, the phonics part, connecting the letters to sounds, is a crucial part in learning to read. Um, and these early readers may also be looking at pictures to confirm their predictions. So the idea of having a text and an illustration is still super important. Um, and they're still here sounding out words as the main strategy while they're practicing. Um, our next group of readers is kind of moving on to be what we call transitional readers, and they're going to start focusing on that comprehension. Um, this is what Liesl mentioned earlier. They like those books in a series. Uh, shared characters, setting, and plot um, are supportive to them as they're going through this stage. Um, they're using a whole bunch of different strategies to compute those words, um, but they still may need help understanding more difficult um, text and are going to continue to really use some of those phonics and be decoding words. And ideally, we get to then fluent readers who read confidently. They have a consistent understanding of how the text works. Um, they hold the meaning of the text in their memory for longer stretches of time. Um, and even at this point, fluent readers are still using that phonological pathway uh, as they read. Uh, I was teaching a class here um, for some Denver Public Library staff yesterday, and I kind of joked that, you know, even as an adult sometimes, <laughs> I'm still decoding words. I have to sound out longer words. Um, this is something that, you know, a skill that stays with us and can be useful um, throughout your life. So we are going to move along and look at what are some of those early books um, that support kids who are just starting to learn to read. So here at the Denver Public Library, we've kind of taken this set of books and put them into two categories. Um, we're calling them early and transitional. If you would like to learn more about this, this is my plug for our collection development session of this series that will be on September 24th. Um, but just know these are terms that we chose um, and your library may use something different and that's fine. This is just the way we, again, um, trying to wrap our head around the best way to um, come up with some tools to support our customers in this process. Um, so. In our world here at the Denver Public Library, early books um, can be found across a variety of places. They are in what we call our beginning reader section. Um, they're also in picture books. They might be a graphic novel, nonfiction. We also include book packs um, in that. So they mostly have 
uh, short words and sentences. Words tend to be one to two syllables, no more than 12 words a sentence. Um, they can be found all over the library, like I mentioned, and we are going to look at some specific examples of what they include. So these early books really have a lot of strong word repetition and clear and simple punctuation. Uh, this is an example from Frog and Toad. Um, you can see there's a lot of repetition in here. The sled hit a tree, the sled hit a rock, um, the sled dived into the so. So the sled and the sled hit repeated uh, multiple times. Uh, simple punctuation, we've just got to worry about an exclamation point and a period. So we're going to go on to another example. This is from a picture book, Owl Sees Owl. This is if you want to talk about super short, this is the book for you. Um, you'll also notice that the font is pretty large. Um, the font sizes tend to be 14 points or larger. Uh, this is related to because when these earliest readers are in there, they are really working on those small muscle movements um, in their eyes to control their eyes as they move from left to right across a page. This can be really challenging for kids. Um, their muscles need to be trained um, and it takes practice just like learning any other motor skill. Um, when kids are starting to read, they are training their eyes and their brain to work together. So having those short words and sentences and a large font can really help with those muscles. Um, the sentences can be very short. Uh, they tend to be declarative sentences. They're easy to decode. Um, and it can also, during this process, take time to sound out words in a sentence. And it can be really easy for new readers to forget at the beginning of a long sentence what happened by the time they've decoded all the way to the end. Uh, so that's why keeping things short and sweet is great. Some other parts that you will see in a good early book is a lot of white space. Uh, in this example from You Are Not Small, it is actually white, but it could be any other color. It is just that, um, that space that gives plenty of room um, and it gives the reader's eyes a chance to rest. They can focus on the word um, and it's not crammed or busy. Um, remember, just like you, when you're using any kind of new muscle and you're working it out and you haven't used it before, it can get tiring. And so having those places to rest can be really important. Um, the other part that goes into this is uh, what's called the letting, and that is the space between lines. Um, this example we have is, is maybe actually not the perfect one for a, a letting example, um, but the space between lines should be equal to the size of the typeface. Um, so it allows the, the reader to focus on the individual words and it's not so crowded. Um, the other thing that we like to see in early books are the illustrations, at least an illustration on every two-page spread. That gives clues for context, it builds interest and motivation um, to keep the reader going. So those are some elements that make up a good early book, and I am going to pass it back on over to Liesl, and she's going to talk about the next one, uh, our transitional books. Thank you, Anne. Uh, yeah, so transitional books are the next step, and just like it says in the name, this is a big transition. It's a big jump. Now that we know how important reading motivation is, it becomes even more important to find books that kids are excited to read as they go through this transition. In her book, From Cover to Cover, KT Horning wrote that transitional books are a bridge from beginning readers to chapter books. And she said, the best transitional books will suggest that the trip across is worth it and that great things await them on the other side. So what we're looking for here are helping books that give kids lots of support as they start reading longer books with more complex sentences and more complex plots. And we're looking for books that they'll love. So to do that, just like it shows here, we're going to go all over the children's section of your library. You can find stuff in the beginning reader series. You might find books in the chapter books section or in the graphic novels or in the nonfiction section. Uh, all over the place, as long as these are books or texts that have the supports that will help kids make that transition, uh, this is a good place to look. You can look everywhere. Uh, let's go over some of the things that make a good transitional book. 
So a lot of these things are going to be similar to what you saw for early books, but it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, longer, a little bit smaller font, that kind of thing. Um, we're still looking for short books, but at this point, uh, you can look for approximately 100 pages. Uh, these these lengths will help kids build focus, and they'll get kids ready for longer books, but they're not too long. Illustrations twice or more a chapter also give kids a break as they read and as they build interest. And just before we move on, a quick note about those illustrations. In the recent past, a lot of teachers might have taught the strategy of looking at a picture when a reader was stuck on a word. So if you didn't know what the word was, look at the picture to see what it was. Lots of research has shown, however, that that's not actually an, an effective strategy for reading. Illustrations are fun. They give context for a story. They give readers a break. But when readers are stuck on a word, they need to focus on decoding the word, not on guessing the word based on the illustration. It's kind of an aside, but I think it helps us to know exactly what is useful when we're looking at early and transitional books. It helps us to know what the reader is doing and, and what the actual supports that they're using are. Uh, when kids are having trouble reading, it's not because they're having a hard time guessing a word based on a picture. Skilled readers aren't guessing. They're using what they understand of a sound letter relationship and then the meanings that they already know to help them decode words, to help them connect the way a word looks with the way a word sounds with the way a word means. All right, other things to look for with our transitional books. As we saw with earlier early books, transitional books with clear, easy to scan text make the task of reading easier. Here too, we're looking for white space that helps developing readers focus on words and that gives the eye a break. Chapters should be fairly short so that readers can have the satisfaction of finishing a section without losing steam. And it can help to have chapters that stand alone so that readers don't have to track a narrative over the course of a whole book. Anne talked about with early books how readers need to track a, a, a narrative over a sentence. They need to track the meaning over the course of a sentence. And transitional readers are ready for longer plots and, and more complex narratives, but uh, it, it can help to have that kind of episodic structure in a transitional book, those, those books where problems will arise and resolve over the course of one chapter. It's not a requirement, but you'll notice it happens a lot in books at this level, and it can be helpful, especially for readers who are just starting out with chapter books. And you can see here on this page, wide margins allow a book with less text to take up more pages. That length supports developing readers as they build focus, but again, it's not overwhelming. A larger font allows for the same thing. Plus, developing readers are still developing the eye muscles that help them focus on small text, just like Anne talked about. Larger fonts continue to help them develop those muscles. It's a good idea to keep an eye on how difficult the vocabulary is, but when I look at transitional books, I'm not as concerned about whether or not vocabulary is as strictly limited as it is when I look at early books. Transitional readers have a lot of vocabulary knowledge from talking and listening, and now that they're developing their reading skills, they're at the stage of sounding out words and connecting them to words they already know. So most words that are commonly used in conversation are available to readers of transitional books. So that's what we look for when we're choosing early and transitional books to suggest to customers. Lots of white space, lots of repetition, clear illustrations, not too long. And now you might be wondering how what we've talked about here relates to the official reading levels uh, in, in in uh, what you might hear when customers come into the library. Uh, Anne might will give you some ideas about how to navigate those reading levels. Great, thanks Liesl. Uh, so do reading levels ever make any of you feel like really lost and confused? I just wanna let you know, never fear, you are not alone. Um, this can be one of those things that can be really difficult and it's already been mentioned in our chat session to uh, navigate a bit with our customers. Um, I think one of the biggest things is just learning a little bit about the leveling systems um, is helpful. There are several out there used by schools, some libraries use them, publishers. They include things that you see on here, the Accelerated Reader, AR, DRA, Fontas and Pinnell, Lexile. Um, here at the Denver Public Library, we use Polaris as our integrated library system, and it actually pulls over um, Lexile levels for us from Novelist. Um, so that's something we're familiar with. Uh, the, in a nutshell, the thing to remember about reading levels is that they were designed to measure the difficulty of the text as well as the reading skills of a reader. 
Um, most of the specific formulas used for reading levels are proprietary and are not made public. Um, there is a, a really interesting part from Fontes and Pinnell um, that they, they claim that there's no single aspect or characteristic of a text that can be used to evaluate reading material. It's a really complex process and includes everything from the length of the book, the number of pages, the number of words, lines on a page, uh, the layout, the things we've already talked about, font and the spacing goes into how something gets leveled, the structure and organization. Um, does it have a simple plot, easy to follow, that might be in an early book, or is it getting a little more complex? Um, the illustrations, are they being a supportive element? Uh, is it using high frequency words, uh, regular spelling of things? Um, how are the phrases and sentences used? There's just a lot that goes in um, to leveling. And we made a conscious choice here at the Denver Public Library not to, um, to use those early and transitional groupings so that we were not necessarily leveling. We wanted it to be, uh, there to be no stigma related to things and we want you to be able to find these books everywhere in the library. It can make it a little more difficult, however, when a customer approaches or a child with this question or this statement, which is, my teacher says I need a level K book. Um, I think this is uh, something that we've probably all encountered over the years. Um, and in a perfect world, leveling is just one tool among many that are used to help readers find books that can challenge and excite them. Um, and we can serve sort of as, I like to see us as a bridge between what the parent and what may be happening at the school, we can help be the translator of that into getting the right book into the right reader's hands. Um, and Liesl's going to talk a little bit more in detail about how to have that conversation. Um, but when this question comes to us, um, you are remembering to look at all of those different things that go into a leveling conversation. So the sentence length, the word repetition, the theme, the subject matter, does this require background knowledge? And then also those intangible factors like interest and appeal always need to be a critical part of the conversation. Um, a tool we quite often use here, this is from the Permabound folks, they have a text leveling correlation guide. Um, so since we have Lexile levels coming over into our catalog, if someone comes up to me and says, I need a level K book, which is actually a guided reading level, I can use this chart to do a little quick translation to what does that mean in the Lexile level that I have, which is the tool that's in my catalog. And I'm going to use a bunch of things together um, in my brain, I'm thinking about also motivation and choice and leveling. Um, and this can be just a great tool to kind of use to guide you and take a little bit of the pressure off. Um, I know back in the day, I used to really freeze when someone <laughs> would mention a, a, a reading level. Um, and this tool helped me not to get stuck in that kind of frozen place. Um, so it's simply another tool you can have in your toolbox as you navigate these tricky conversations about leveling with customers. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Liesl, who's going to talk a little bit in more in detail about how to have that conversation. Wonderful. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so yeah, you're familiar now with the five skills of grade level reading. You can identify what makes a good early and transitional book, and you've got some understanding of reading levels. So with all of this information in your reader's advisory backpack, you are now ready for the question, where are your books for first graders? To answer this question, you could probably point in a direction and say, the chapter books are over there, the beginning readers are over there, and be done with it. That's an answer, but it doesn't really help the customer understand what they're looking for. Remember, many parents and caregivers haven't thought about books that are good for first graders since they were first graders. Once we've learned to read, we don't usually think about how we did it. It's an experience that adults might not even remember. So let's talk about some ways that we can help kids and grown-ups figure out how to find the books that will support them in their learning to read process. So when someone asks you uh, if you have, if you, oh, you know what, let me, yeah, 
when someone asks you if, if you have uh, books for first graders, start with a yes. Start with, yes, we have lots of great books for first graders. You can help find them in a few different places. And then start asking them questions. Turn it into an advisory interview. Maybe you'll ask, would you like some suggestions? Are you looking for a read aloud or a book for independent reading? What kind of book are you in the mood for? And what do you like to read about? I saw a lot of these suggestions in Anne's uh, first question, the, the icebreaker question about what are your tips for reader's advisory. And I think that's exactly it. I think sometimes grown-ups come into the library and they think, OK, I know what I need. I'm just going to ask a question and be done with it. And we can try to help them as quickly as possible. But I think taking the time to have a little back and forth, to ask some questions, to figure out specifically what, they're ne what they need, I think that makes all the difference in the world. And remember the importance of choice in reading motivation. Choice, again, it's the, our best thing. It's what we do best at our libraries. Many schools are trying to combat reading gaps by limiting choice in their classrooms. It might not be intentional, but it's an unintended outcome of trying really hard to fix the problem in a measurable way. Often what you'll find is that, especially for struggling readers, school programs focus on guided reading. In those programs, what you'll sometimes see is that the books kids are given are precisely selected by reading level, with not a lot of other considerations taking into account. And although, like Anne said, reading level can be a really helpful data point when selecting books for kids, choice is so, so important too. So when we help kids find books at the library, we're in a perfect position to let kids know that their preferences and their interests matter. I saw some people talking too in, in the chat about how we can let grown-ups know that, that this matters too. And I think some of it is just the confidence of we know that the research backs this up, that, that kids learn to read better when they have some choice in the matter and when they're engaged by what they're reading. So I think that is, is, a, is a big part of it. It's just we know that this is research-backed and, and it's helpful. We can't always convince every grown-up. Uh, and we're not meant to. Grown-ups are, are allowed to, all customers are allowed to find what they're looking for and what they would like. But it helps us, I think, to know that this, is, this has a real foundation. Um, because when they're interested, kids can often utilize a variety of comprehension strategies to read above their assigned reading level. And even if they're not able to decipher the text, high interest can be a very motivating factor for a developing reader. So it can help them read those books about robots or Star Wars or ballet that may not be at their precise reading level. When we find books for adults, we often look for appeal factors like character, storyline, illustration style. So just remember to take those into account when you look for books for early and developing readers too. And for early and developing readers, as with all of our customers, our goal is to send kids home happy, satisfied, and with the resources they need. With kids, there are a few factors that make this a little more complicated. To start, there are often more people involved in the interaction. There might be a grown-up accompanying the child with strong opinions of their own, and there might be an invisible educator somewhere in the background. Although the teacher probably isn't there right in the moment, they might have sent the, children to the, li the child to the library with a very specific book to look for. And to make matters worse, the child and the caregiver may not know or understand exactly what the educator wants. Moreover, as we've discussed, the intersection between interest and reading level might be a tricky one. So what do we do? How do we solve that? that Inter interaction between grown-up, educator, child, and then and us in our collection. My suggestion is to remind customers that the library is a place of yes. If there's not one perfect book, try two or three. Maybe you can find a book that matches a child's reading level perfectly. But if that book doesn't match a child's interests quite as perfectly, find a book to fill the need for an interesting book. Then just send the child home with both books, the one at the right level and the one that's super interesting. Encourage the child to read books above their level with an adult's help, or encourage a caregiver to read the book out loud to their children or to their child. We can help our customers get the most out of the books that interest them by suggesting ways that they can support their reading. And maybe you're not sure exactly what that invisible educator wants. Maybe the reporting isn't going exactly how you need it to go to know exactly what that educator is looking for. The great thing about this strategy of finding more books is that you can send a, a child home with, with several books, and even if one doesn't meet all of the needs that we've discussed throughout this presentation, together, multiple books can check all of the boxes. Even more importantly, we know that in order to become skilled readers, learners need to read tons of books at, above, and below their assigned reading levels. So that's how they get the practice they need to understand a variety of texts. When we combine study at school with learning at home with the bounty of books that we offer at our libraries, we've got exactly what kids need to become lifelong readers. 
All right, now let's practice. Uh, Christine, I think you were going to bring up three scenarios in the polls, and we want to know what ideas do you have about how to handle each of these questions in your library? Yep, you can type your, your thoughts about this as a short answer. So this first one is, where are the books that teach my child to read? Imagine a grown-up comes into you and says, gives you that question. Where can I find the books that teach my child to read? The second one is, my child reads books at, a, at accelerated reading level 3.2. I only want books at that level. And then this third one, my kid is reading chapter books, but still likes pictures with their stories. Where are those books? So what do you think? What are, what are some ways that you would answer these questions? Imagine that, that a grown up or a kid comes in and is asking these questions. What are your thoughts? Like we've got some people typing on that first question, where are the books that teach my child to read? That's a tricky one, and it's one I get fairly regularly. You know, grown-ups really want to help support their kids. They, they, uh, they're not sure what to do, but they know they need to do something, so they come in with that question. Yeah, Kate, exactly. So starting with the yes, starting with we've got a ton of books that will help. What does your child like to learn about? I think that's great. You know, I often have to remember there's not one book that will teach a child to read, right? It's about the interaction between grown-ups and kids and that process. It's it's not a, a single thing. It's a, it's a process. Yeah, Joyce, asking questions, trying to get more ideas about what they're looking for. Yep, letting them know that if they're enjoying the experience, they're doing something right. I think that's exactly it. Yep, and Marianne, you say to ask questions and turn it into a, an advisory interview. I think exactly. And Jennifer, I think that's great. The idea of giving them an introduction of the beginning reader section, I think that's super important uh, as we're, as we're pushing them off into a, into a realm of the library that they might not know very much about. Yep, exactly. A lot of you are saying that this book, where are the books, that, or this question, where are the books that teach my child to read? Really, it's a, it's a question that needs a ton more questions to follow up. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, lots of folks are saying that this just takes a ton of follow-up questions. All right, I'm going to go look at this. My child reads at an accelerated level, reader level 3.2. Carrie points out that Novelist, if your library has access to the database Novelist, that there's an AR search function. Yes, and the leveling chart that Anne showed, I think I use that all the time. Oh, Kate has AR color stickers. It doesn't drill down to the decimals. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, we don't have any leveling like that on our on our books here, um, partly because our, our schools don't consistently use AR. The schools in DPS use tons of different leveling systems. What I have to remember a lot with, uh, with the leveling is that it's a question that's going to take a lot of time. There's not, for me, there's not a single right way to find the answer. Oh, nice, Kate. Yeah, that makes sense. Then you can be more aligned with that one, one school system.
And Alex says, starting with, with the yes, starting with sure, I can absolutely help you find those. And Marianne points out that not all books have been leveled. Yep, just like Anne said, these leveling systems are proprietary and publishers have to pay to have books leveled often. So not everything will have the level. Yep, it's a guide only, exactly. All right, let's turn our attention to this last one. My kid is reading chapter books, but still likes pictures with their stories. Deborah says, I try to make suggestions of chapter books that I know of, yeah, that also have engaging pictures. Yeah, I think having a list in your head is a great place to start, just kind of familiarizing yourself with some of these, these options. Um, and Anne plugged the collection development session of this, this supporting grade level reading training. We have got, we've got some ideas in there about how to do that. All right, y'all, do your, let's, let's get our last feedback on this and then we'll come back together and, uh, and move on to fly through the, the very, very last bits of this training. Okay, so Marianne does have the simplest chapter books marked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you might, in your library, you might have these books marked. You might have them in a specific section. I know some libraries do put these books in a specific section, but lots of libraries don't and we don't in DPL. What I like to do is I just like to identify them as they come in for new books or I like to go through and just have some in my back pocket that I know about. It's, it's another question that takes some interaction. It takes some back and forth for sure. Jennifer says again, ask more questions. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, y'all, I hate to cut this short, but uh, we have a few more slides to get through before one. Thank you, Christine. Um, let's let's come back together. So I'll just share a few more resources and a few more ideas and then we'll be at the end of our time today. So where to find that last question, where to find good early and transitional books? These are some ideas here. The Geisel Award is a is a great award to know about. The Guessing Geisel blog is a is a blog that uh, discusses books that might be eligible for the Geisel Award. Um, this third one on the list, the Great Early Elementary Reads Book List, is from ALSC, the Association for Library Service to Children, and it's a good starting point if you want to familiarize yourself with a variety of, of good transitional books. And then this last suggestion here, it's a little bit of a, a self-plug, but uh, children's librarians here at Denver Public Library maintain this website with lots of books of, lists of book suggestions, um, so check those out for regularly updated suggestions. And then just a quick note before we finish, remember to include passive advisory in your, in, in your thought process. Um, we've got these post-it notes that we do here at the Central Library and Denver Public Library that we put on books to give caregivers some ideas about, about things they can talk about. We've got this, uh, this sign that encourages kids to talk to librarians about their books. Um, passive advisory is, is not something to ignore because it's the way we reach a lot of our kids. Um, Here's another, another picture of some, some ways that we display early and transitional books. And yeah, now you know. You know all about the five grade level reading skills. You're familiar with what to look for in texts for de developing readers. You've got a bird's eye view of reading levels. So hopefully you're ready. You're feeling ready to go forth and share these ideas about early and transitional books and books for, for developing readers with your customers. As Grace Lynn says, there's nothing easy about beginning readers, but I hope you feel ready to go forth and, and share these, these really great books with some of your customers. Thanks everyone for your time today. Don't forget to attend these, these other sessions uh, at, with CSL in session. And last but certainly not least, here are some sources and further reading. Christine pointed out that these are available for download over on the left side of your screen. So if you want to know where we got these ideas or if you want to know more about some of these subjects, feel free to check these out. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attending. Thank you for your time and your engagement.